higher. I thought that this video would be about Richard II's hollow crown speech. It's a really famous speech in an excellent play. Um, Richard II is one of the most grandiose and eloquent speakers in um, the array of Shakespeare's characters. And interestingly, Richard II is held by some as the first great tragedy. Yes, it is a history, but it's a great tragedy uh, by Shakespeare because here is the first time we see someone in such a lofty position brought low. You see, Richard II is quite an arrogant character. He's not a mighty warrior, but he believes vehemently in the divine right of the king. And when we come to this scene about the hollow crown, Richard II's worldview has come crumbling down around his ears. He's confronted, and we as an audience, especially through his eyes, are confronted with mortality. And this is the genius of tragedy by Shakespeare. His tragedies always entail a very superior kind of person. It's not a common folk. Because if the tragedy can happen to them, we end up seeing and relating to every feeling um, that the tragic heroes go through, but we see it on such an elevated scale. So if you're studying this for GCSE, or just because you want to become more familiar with uh, Shakespeare's works and just bask in the beauty of his language, then I encourage you to get out your play, Richard II, and go to Act 3, Scene 2. Now, where this speech comes, he's already made a few mini speeches on the way, and it would be nice to look at them all together. However, I am I fear I'm not able to do that. Um, otherwise, the video would runneth on too long, as it were, into hours and hours. So let's just get a quick background, quick one. Richard II, he becomes king when he's young. He has an uncle who's very powerful called the Duke, uh, John of Gaunt. John of Gaunt dies earlier in the play and he prophesies that Richard will ruin the kingdom because he has got such a high-minded view of himself. He doesn't feel he needs the other barons and earls around him to rule. He feels he is appointed not by the baron's consent, but by the divine hand of God. And as such, he is above everybody. And he behaves like that. Um, and he gets a clique of followers who he relies on more than anything else. And of course, this puts all the other barons' noses out of joint. Now, what makes this worse? John of Gaunt's son is a, a man called Henry Bolingbroke, who would later become Henry IV because he deposes Richard. Now, earlier in the play, you see Richard exile Henry Bolingbroke. And after Bolingbroke's dad dies... Richard does not pass on the lands to Bolingbroke. He claims them for the crown itself, saying, you don't inherit by um, hereditary right. Rather, you get your lands from the king. They are mine and I give them to whomever I wish. You see this high-handed manner in him. And what this does, it causes Bolingbroke to raise a small army in France. And while Richard is away in Ireland uh, fighting, Bolingbroke invades Britain and tries to get the support of the barons and the great magnates of the land. And overall, as history testifies, they join him. They agree. They're sick of Richard's high-handedness. Now, Act 3, Scene 2, finds Richard just landed back on the coast of Wales, part of Britain. And... He's coming back because he's heard Bolingbroke's rebelled and he's going to come and crush the rebellion. But now he's there, he gets report after report after report that many of the great barons of the land have moved over to Henry and supporting him. And three characters who Richard really wanted the support of have fought and died and had their heads cut off by Bolingbroke. And after a series of bad news... Richard suddenly begins to realise that he is just a man. His worldview comes crumbling down. But it's done in such brilliant language. And that's the thing. Don't prepare this for an exam. Enjoy the language. It, 
It will open up your entire soul to yourself. You'll start feeling and understanding you as a person by the way this king speaks of himself. So find the part in Act 3, Scene 2 that starts with King Richard. He says, no matter where, because one of his friends has just said, where is my father with his power? In other words, oh, if my father comes with a bit of an army, we can get going. He's trying to keep Richard's hopes up. But this is what Richard says. No matter where. Of comfort, no man speak. So he's saying, it doesn't matter where your father and his army is. It won't be enough. And then he says, of comfort, no man speak. Stop trying to keep my hopes up with, if we get this support, if we get that. Don't you realise everyone is moving over to Bolingbroke? So that's what he said. And he probably gives it in a commanding way. Of comfort, no man speak. I'm sick of hearing this. Now, watch the change of a man who is always confident of God's backing and of his divine right. Look at what he says next as he recognises his own mortality. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Do you understand that? He's saying, don't talk about comfort anymore, how we can get out of this situation. Instead, he gets quite morose. He says, let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. The graveyard, the end of all humanity. We're going to die, my man. Don't tell me I can escape. I want to talk of graves now, of worms, really base, being eaten by worms, of epitaphs. That's the inscription on a gravestone. He's going to turn his thoughts to mortality, not to the divine kingship. And then he says, make dust our paper. So imagine the floor is our paper and with rainy eyes or with tears running from our eyes, we will write as if writing on paper. We'll write in the dust with our, with our crying tears, sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Now, this is a really interesting expression he uses here. Sorrow, obviously sorrow, being down, sad, lament, because he realises he's finished. But it's interesting what he says. He, he says, write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Now, when he first landed in Wales, he says, I salute you, earth, as if he's the captain of the earth. The earth is something that serves him. He also says that he greets his kingdom, the land, the earth, back. He says, I greet it a bit like uh, a mother when she has been separated from her child for a little while and comes home and sees them with tears and smiles. She plays with her child. And Richard said, that's like him. I've come back like the mother and with playfulness in my heart and happy weeping, I'm pleased to see you, my land of England. But... What did he say here? He said, let's write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. No longer is he the nursing mother of his realm. He's asking the earth to be his nurse and he can weep like a child into its bosom. That's a great antithesis when you put those two things together, that contrasting of one against the other. So let's carry on. He then says... Let's choose executors and talk of wills, and yet not so. For what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? So again, following on talking of graves, worms and epitaph, he says, let's choose executors. An executor is someone who carries out your last will and testament. So who am I going to leave everything to? I'll pick someone who, when I'm dead, will go about passing on my inheritance to others. Um, and that's why he says talk of will, will and testament. But did you notice he then said, yet not so. For what can we bequeath? Save our deposed bodies to the ground. If Richard's lands depend upon his title as king, and Henry Bolingbroke now looks almost certain to depose him, what inheritance has Richard left to give to anybody? So he says, let's make executors and make a will, but hang on, hang on, I've got nothing left to give, to bequeath. 
except add deposed bodies to the ground. The only thing I can give is my body, which means nothing now, it's deposed from the throne, to the earth in death. And in recognition of what's happened, he carries on and says, Our lands, our lives and all are Bolingbrooks. And nothing can we call our own but death and that small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. Uh, can you hear the, the pathos in this? Um, actually, when you talk about someone being pathetic, it doesn't mean an idiot. Pathetic means full of sorrowful feeling, it's pathos. He's saying here, our lands, guys, me, the king, and you who support me, all our lands which we own, and our lives, because we have no army big enough to fight Bolingbroke, and all, he says, our lands, our lives, and all, are Bolingbrokes. Henry's won, guys. Don't try and comfort me. What does he say is the only thing they have left? He says, we can't call anything our own except our death. That's the only thing I can die. That's something I can do. But as for lands and titles, and we don't have any now. Bolingbroke has them all. And then he makes this lovely allusion to um, the scriptures when he says, we can give nothing but our death and that small model of the barren earth, which serves as paste and cover to our bones. Right. So on the one hand, the small model of barren earth, imagine the earth that's dug up to put a body inside. Okay. You've got this small little model shape of a human being. Okay. And that's all we've got to, to give is that. On the other hand, more accurately, if you think of the Genesis account, um, Adam is made from the dust of the ground. He is formed from the dust of the ground. Hence, our body, formed from the dust of the ground, is a model of the barren earth. It's been shaped out of the clay. And what, what's the famous phrase? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So this is all we can give. This dust that has been shaped and it's just paste and cover to our bones. So we've got our bones and our flesh and our skin made from the dust by God. It's just paste. It's just a covering for our, for our bones. Nothing more. I mean, look at that. The grandeur of the king. And now he recognises all I am is skin and bones, really. All I am is flesh. I'm mortal. And it's interesting that he talks about the barren earth. Because what did he do when he landed in Wales? I salute you, earth. And he says, give not your food to our enemies. You know, grow not food for our enemies is what he had said earlier. And now instead of talking about the productiveness of his realm, he calls it the barren earth. Barren means lacking. And what did he say? We haven't got anything. Our lives, our lands and all are forfeit to Bolingbroke. So all I have is this barren body to give. What a great sort of collapse of his own self-view. Now, when he recognises that I've lost, God is not going to stand and strike on my behalf. He then says a very, very famous line. Here it is. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have disposed, deposed, sorry, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed. All murdered. Now, do you see that? The recognition has come in upon him. We're finished. And although he's an arrogant character, he is so eloquent in the play. He does carry himself so majestically that you can't help but feel for him here when he says... Let us sit upon the ground. What king sits on the ground? Think of what people do when they meet the king. They bow. But they don't just bow, they go on one knee onto the ground. It's an abasement. Now the king sits upon a throne, a majestic throne. Richard's actual um, crown jewels were majestic. We know that from some artifacts found. But here he's saying, let's sit on the ground just abase ourselves and then in a melancholy a glorious melancholy he says and tell sad stories of the death of kings 
the death of kings, not let's tell great tales of amazing kings. Let's tell sad stories. He's feeling sorry for himself. But more than just in a pitiable, you know, kiddish kind of way that we'd mock, he's thinking, I can't believe this. Everything's gone. Kings die. And then he enumerates a way that kings had gotten rid of. He says how some have been deposed. He may be talking about himself. He's already acknowledging, I am deposed. Although technically he is still king and he hasn't handed the crown over to Henry, which he'll do later. He recognises right here, right now, I'm deposed. Then he says other kings are slain in battle. They may be valiant. That may be their, their star turn, as it were. They're valiant, but they can get killed in battle. He says some are haunted by the ghosts that they have deposed. Now, for me, that makes me think of Macbeth. Um, of course, I think that comes later than Richard II, but he may already have done some um, preparatory work on Macbeth, Shakespeare. So Macbeth is haunted by the ghost of Duncan, who he killed. Um, then he said some have been poisoned by their wives. Then he said some sleeping killed. Uh, so murdered in their sleep. Um, and again in Macbeth, Duncan is killed while he's sleeping. But other kings have as well. And then he says all murdered. It's not just all kings pass away gently into the night. Actually, when I look at the scene of history, many, many a monarch, instead of being immortal, untouchable, um, indestructible. Many a king has actually been murdered. Now you're no demigod if you can be murdered. And so he's recognising I'm just a man. And amongst the kings I, I may think I'm a special king but others have been killed. He's already said some have been deposed so he's probably saying I know I'm deposed. Or murdered. And then this is where Richard strikes out and touches right on the bullseye of mortality. And this is really, really beautiful language, okay? And imagery, the imagery is astounding. Let's look at what he says next. All murdered is where we got to. Now imagine he takes off the crown now and looks at it. He says... For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene, to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks. We'll just stop at that bit. So he says all ki these kings, I can think of them, they're all murdered. And then he takes off the crown. Now imagine Holt having got a crown with me, uh, would you believe? <laughs> um... He holds a crown in front of him and imagine him looking in the, the circle of the crown as if it's a palace room. And he says, for within the hollow crown, not the golden crown. He's referred to a golden crown earlier in, in the play. Oh yeah, it's something majestic. But suddenly, what does he realise about any pomp, any glory, any title? It's vanity. This is a hollow, empty crown. What does it mean? But then he says, imagine that the hollow crown in there is the scene of a court. So the, the chief chambers of the palace. He says, for within the hollow crown keeps death his court. Now, interestingly, in scripture again, Shakespeare would be well aware of this, as would all those around him. Death is referred to as king. Death has ruled as king over mankind uh, since the beginning. Now, he's just saying, I've been wearing this crown on my head and all the time in, that, in the hollow of that crown, death has been sitting as the real king. Death has outlasted every other king in history. It says he keeps his court. So death sits with a majesty and uh, it rules, not the king who's wearing the crown. It says, there the antic sits, antic joker. So, in other words, death is both a king and is a joker. He plays with those who think they are something. So, in the hollow crown, keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, 
scoffing at his state. Scoffing, to mock. If you think of the word scoff, pah, yeah, huh, it's disrespectful. Who's he scoffing at? It's death, scoffing at the king's state, his majesty, okay? We say the king sits in state. That's when he's got all of his robes on, all of the crown jewels, all of his courtiers and earls sat beneath him. He's in state. Death, while the king is sat there with his crown on, feeling majestic, inside the crown, death is mocking the king. It says he's grinning at his pomp. In other words, he's smirking at him. Oh yeah, nice, you got all those lovely clothes. Oh, good for you. <laughs> you don't know what's coming. So he scoffs and he grins at his pomp. And it says, <laughs> love this, allowing him a breath, a little scene. It's almost like a, um, someone letting a child pretend to play at something. They pretend to be an astronaut, okay? Um, they pretend that they're in charge of the house for a while. They play mums and dads. Death is letting this man who's wearing a crown have a little scene. Just a little walk on the stage, as it were. Pretend that he's a king. It says, it gives him a breath. Um, again, in Psalms, we have this phrase that man is a mere exhalation. And that's our life over. And compared to the longevity of death through history, even the greatest king is but a breath in existence by comparison. And then, what does it say he will do? It says that he allows him to monarchize. <laughs> that's what he says here. Um, it says, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks. So monarchize, to be a monarch, or better, to pretend at being a monarch. Death is a king. You little, you little monarch down there, you're monarchizing, you're pretending to be a king. Oh yes, you can be feared. Richard had got people fearful of him. You can kill your subjects with looks. Just a look from the king and put you to death. But really, it's nothing. Death, the antic within the hollow crown, is mocking. Then he says about this, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. So death is allowing, infusing, so if you leave a tea bag in a drink, it slowly, its flavours come out, okay? So death, by allowing the king to be a king for a while and wear the crown, it makes the king feel inside a conceit, a pride. He is different. He is greater than other men. He is uh, made of different stuff. He doesn't have the same outcomes as them. And then it says, it makes him feel as if his flesh, which walls about our life, so the flesh that makes our body, okay? We are living beings and we have flesh around us. But death makes the king feel, for the time he's wearing the crown, as if his flesh were brass impregnable. Other people's flesh may cut and scar, may rot when they pass away, but not I. I am a king. I am made of brass. I am indestructible. You can't hurt me. You can't touch me. And that's how Richard has felt through all of this. He's managed to get his way all of the time. It feels as if he's untouchable. But now he's realised death is just making me feel I've got a little scene and as if I'm made of brass. Because look what he says next that death does. Once death has finished with him, as in finished letting him play the king, it says, humoured thus. So death's had his laugh at the king. Oh, hasn't he been lovely pretending to be a king there? It says, Death comes at the last, and with a little pin, bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king. So once death has had enough, death personified, we're talking about, once death has had enough of the king strutting his stuff, even though he thinks he's made of brass impregnable, it says all death needs to do is come with a pin. And he bores through the castle wall, that's the life, the flesh of the king, and... Farewell, king. What can the king do to stop death? And interestingly, the way this would be said, and farewell, 
king. And it turns this from being total pathos into sarcasm. Richard mocks his own title. Farewell, king. What is a king if he's dead? In fact, he's no more than any other man. So let's carry on. Realising this, now look what he says to those around him. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form and ceremonious duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? Do you get that brilliant rounding up? And do you notice how the, the pentameter, the, the ten syllable, ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum, just makes things move along and pulls on our emotions? Because what's he saying? He says, cover your heads. Cover your heads. They may be standing listening to him with their caps off, with their hats off, holding them in respect. He said, put your hats back on. When we're in the company of someone who's higher than us, it's polite to take the hat off. He's saying, put your hats back on. Don't mock flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Do not revere flesh and blood. I am just a man. I'm just like you. And this is Richard. Richard's never thought this. But now, do you see, it's, he's cracked. Bolingbroke has won. He knows it. And he's saying, stop mocking me with solemn reverence. Stop acting like I'm a king that's going to get out of this. He says, throw away respect. That's respect for the king. Tradition. The traditions. Think how long the monarchy had been running. Throw away that. Stop all the bowing before me. Form. You know, good form. Very English expression. Good form. Um, that's the way of behaviour, etiquette before a king, knowing who is in what line of um, societal um, status. Um, and ceremonious duty, all the ceremony. You, someone carries this for the king, someone carries his cloak, all that. Forget all that. Don't mock me because I'm a nothing. Didn't he say there, I live with bread like you. I have to eat. Then he says, I feel want. I feel needs for things. I taste grief. So if he lost a loved one, he would feel sad. He's not above that just because he's a king. In fact, he's losing everything now. And how does he feel? Awful. Uh, in one production of this play, you see, um, I think it's David Tennant. He's crawling around the floor while he says all of this because he's just completely pitiable. And then he says, I need friends. Now, that's a very big admission in this play because Richard has always ruled as if he needs nobody. But right now, what does he need? Remember he said, right sorrow on the bosom of the earth. He needs someone to hug and comfort him. And then he says, in the best words you could pick, subjected thus. Bingo. What do kings have? They have subjects. People who obey them. But now he's realised he is mere mortal flesh. And that death keeps court in the hollow crown. Death is the real ruler over humans. What does that make Richard? Not a king, but a subject. He is a subject of King Death, like everyone else. And that's why he says, how can you call me a king? Because I can do nothing to save myself. So, I think in another video, um, I'm going to read this same section without any explanation, just read it in three different ways to show you how you can interpret the way that this speech is given. You could give it in anger, for instance. You could give it as if he's breaking down into tears. You could give it as if he's going mad. You can give it in a philosophical recognition of how life really is. So when I post that, I'll put a link in the description below. And um, I encourage you to look at it, but also to read the passage out for yourself. Because the words he's just used in that, my goodness, 
If you could express, if I could express my feelings and thoughts in those words, imagine how rich your life would be. Because to express them, you would have to be able to think in them. And words are the colours with which we paint our lives. And if you can paint like that, then you live a life of luxury. So I hope this has been enjoyable. Please, please, please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this. I don't presume on you to have enjoyed it, but if you have, and uh, leave me a comment. Ask me um, if you'd like me to cover anything else, be it from Shakespeare or from other classic literature. It doesn't have to be plays, it can be books. At the moment I'm doing Shakespeare, but if you want me to cover something else, leave a suggestion in the, in the comments below. And uh, I hope you enjoy your Shakespeare and that you'll go and revisit this play. Thank you.